Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and start. Excuse my voice today. Um, but as Bill knows, I actually can speak today. Yesterday Better wasn't. Off today and yesterday. Yeah. You're amazing. So, great. Um, colleagues, I'd like to. Claire, did you check on me? They want to go consent. Okay. No then. secret. Withdraw the speaker. Okay. Uh, if we can, uh, Mr. Rosendahl, I'd like to um, have one through seven and item number 10. Uh, go on consent. This is a question, and thank you to Jeffrey Jacoberger. I know you're here in support of 10. Um, so moved. So moved. So uh, we will take those on consent. One, two, three, uh, four. Cards? Madam Chair, you oh, have cards. cards on those items. Stephen Box, you have comment cards on these. Sorry about that. Stephen, where are you? You have on three, four, five. Actually, we also have someone on six. I'm sorry. I apologize. So. We're not going on the on consent then. So, um, Stephen, you want to come up? Do you want to talk on on the first? You had three, four, and five. Four, five and seven. Sure, go ahead. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. How are you? Sorry, just wanting to make sure I got your cards out. Thank you. Stephen Box, I'm here to speak on uh, three, four, five, six, and seven, otherwise known as the. Uh, speed limit increases in the valley and I have two objections the first one is that we're increasing speed limits in the valley and I do think there are other mechanisms for exploring uh, bringing the prevailing speed and the appropriate speed limit in line so that we can of course invoke the radar and laser enforcement uh, and satisfy the state law but most significantly I'm opposed to the three four five six and seven based on process and to quote you flawed process Flawed results, and so I would suggest that the neighborhood councils have not had the opportunity to agendize and weigh in on these items, to send them notification, but to not give them time to actually convene a meeting. The Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council would be meeting tonight, and then when it was in commission, it was the same thing. The notification comes out three, five, seven, ten days, fifteen days. To know this this subject is floating out there in the uh, world is not quite the same as giving them notice uh, such as planning does. And so that's why the neighborhood councils are banging away at the uh, process by which we engage on these topics. This particular, these uh, five speed limit revisions have been in the works for over a year. I believe the uh, order was signed in January of 08. And so it's unfortunate that it takes a freedom of information request uh, to get the files from downtown to the valley, the engineering files for these particular documents. When we did that, we found that one particular proposal was on a street that also had street calming. So we're raising the speed limits on a street that also had street calming. In other words, it's up to us to double check and to buy in and be part of the process. One of these is Mulholland, and nobody, nobody to a person from that neighborhood has said, hmm, raising the speed limit on Mulholland's a good idea. What they did say is that they think there should be signage that includes skull and crossbones because that's how dangerous it is on Mulholland. I thank you for your consideration, but I would ask you to uh, reject these five speed limit increase proposals, one, based on process, and two, stop raising the speed limit. Okay. Thank and, you. And thanks, Stephen. And um, I know, is there, which one is the one that you said that is, has the calming? Is that one of the five that's before? That got pulled off. They got pulled off. Yes. Okay. Uh, and if, if um, depending upon what we do today, um, and having it not go to council until the neighbor council has had input into that. Um, is that as well as an option? Well, the, actually, uh, Are you, does, is it on your agenda tonight in the Woodland Hills area? The Woodland Hills, in spite of the fact that we didn't have much time, we did get a, um, the Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council has actually uh, sent in a statement saying they're opposed to this particular speed limit increase. But in general, uh, it is a process that uh, has not gone to the neighborhood council. There's a half dozen neighborhood councils that are affected by these. That's just one neighborhood council. I was also at Reseda, but I couldn't speak because it wasn't agendized. Okay. So I um, got to and we have to yeah. get that to speak. So, okay. uh, no, we have okay. a chance. Thank you. And I give, you know, you, you would put your cards on each of them, so I wanted to yeah. give you a little bit more time to do that. Um, since we're all, <clears throat> excuse me, we also have cards um, on item number three, Arisha Smolarski and James Anderson, and item number six, so it's all around the same. And then we were going to have the department, would you like to have the department come up before you speak? Okay. Sorry, I didn't do that before you, Stephen. Um, could the department come up and respond? Because, Stephen, it always seems antithetical to me, and we've 
been working um, uh, with the department to like, respond to kind of change state law uh, because the the challenge is, and they'll describe this, um, and, and I, I fought it because of some of the issues on uh, uh, street racing that I had in my district in, and in Peoria, uh, uh, one of the streets there, about being able to enforce with radar and not enforce. My concept is what I'd like to get state legislation to do uh, is to allow local governments to have more control. The whole concept, and they've educated me, so hopefully I'll say this right. In, in, in the last couple of years, they can uh, uh, tell you how I've pounded on them is that um, they tried, the reason there's the state law is because some of the small rural communities, you know, would put, you'd be 65 and then it'd go down to 15 miles per hour, and they, that would be a speed trap. And so unfortunately, they <clears throat> made laws. Uh, that have impacted all of us and I'd like to see and we've had some conversations with state legislators to change that so that local urban areas could um, have greater control over being able to enforce with a radar gun um, differently because my comment has been if Riverside Drive for example in my district if people were driving 65 miles an hour and that was their average speed doesn't make sense to make it 65 miles per hour um, as their average speed, that you could only do that by radar. Um, uh, so I think there is somewhere in between that we'd like to see see happen. So with that, sorry, my preamble. Uh, I, yes, uh, Council Member Gruel and members of the committee, John Fisher, Assistant General Manager. I'm joined here by Carolyn Jackson of the department and Officer Troy Williams, uh, who uh, w with whom we coordinate on speed limit matters in the uh, valley. Uh, with regard to the immediate concern that was presented by Mr. Box, we notified the neighborhood councils in October of our uh, recommendations regarding the speed limit. In addition, we have um, attended, and particularly uh, Troy Williams has attended, several meetings with the neighborhood councils to discuss with them their concerns, to discuss with them uh, their need for enforcement using radar, and to discuss with them uh, the state law that we have to apply. Um, keep in mind, we only, th the point I wanted to make is that throughout the city, there are 700 speed limits that have to be renewed on a seven year cycle. We, so there's about 100 every year that we get. And it's only a very small percentage of those that we bring to the city council and to the committee for consideration of changing the speed limit. The vast majority of the matters that we handle with regard to speed limits are generally renewed at the existing speed limit and therefore do not have to go before council. So you only see a small percentage of those. Um, we recognize that speed limit matters are, is a very emotional issue. There are pros, there are cons, there are neighborhood groups that say we don't want it increased on our street and then there are motorists who say we don't want to be unfairly ticketed for driving in a normal fashion as everyone does. So our role at DOT is to look at the objective data after the police department indicates that they need radar enforcement. And we look at what the prevailing speeds are, we look at the collision history, we look at any surprise conditions, we look for any specific accident patterns. And I can tell you with the speed limit proposals that are before you, um, in every case, we have identified the speed limit, <clears throat> and it is at such a level that at least 85% of the motorists are driving at that speed or below. Keep in mind that it is a speed limit that is ideal for non-peak period conditions during sunny weather and such. Certainly, these speeds would not be appropriate on a rainy day or during the peak period, but for ideal off-peak period conditions. We looked at the collision history, and in all cases, the collision history is uh, in the very normal range. In fact, in most cases, it's below normal. And on Mulholland, it's below normal. And we look at any surprise conditions, and we consider all those. So this is the objective information that uh, we have. It complies with the State Vehicle Code and the uh, Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. <coughs> Officer Troy, would you like to mention? 
The uh, proposed speed limit increases that we're talking about today, the uh, Valley Traffic Division has reviewed these streets. These are streets that have been identified as uh, primary collision arteries throughout the San Fernando Valley. And um, I have spoken to every neighborhood council in the, in the uh, CD3 area regarding these speed limit increases and proposed and explained to them the nature of the increases and why they're not a dangerous thing that by raising the speed limits five miles per hour on most of these streets, we're actually going to allow the motorists to travel at the normal speed that they're already traveling without having to keep looking in their mirrors for us every single time. And that these are not dangerous speed limits that we're asking for. Anytime that we have identified a street that we feel is going to have to be raised at an extremely high speed, we have worked with DOT to not propose a speed limit increase. But we support these speed limit increases. If I could interrupt, officer, but you did go before the council, so there was a process that was open that everybody was aware of. So he's not talking to you, he's talking to the officer. I had made arrangements with each neighborhood council in the CD3 area, and I attended every single one of those meetings. Now, I understand that I wasn't on the agenda. I was there as a guest speaker, but I spoke to the neighborhood councils during think, the month of November. I, I just was curious because I had heard something different. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Jackson. I'm a senior management analyst with the Department of Transportation, and one of my duties now is uh, communication with neighborhood councils. The purpose of my visit with you today is to let you know what our current process is and to let you know that this process began in October. The item three on your agenda today, the neighborhood councils received five notifications from me personally telling them when it was agendized for the Transportation Commission, whether or not there was a quorum for that meeting, how they could comment, then after the commission acted, I sent them an email telling them what that action was, and then I told them what the next step in the process would be, which was to come to you, and how they could best submit their comments to your committee for its hearing today. I believe that in each case, I've given them no fewer than five notifications by email. On a couple of occasions, I've had telephone conversations. The specific reference that Mr. Box made to the Woodland Hills Chamber of Commerce, I did speak with Joyce Pearson of the Woodland Hills Chamber on one of these items, and she expressed that though they didn't really like the idea that the speed limit was going up, they did agree that radar enforcement was needed. And they are working at the state level to try to get some legislation changed so that we can then do what seems more reasonable to most people. But at the current time, this is the law as Mr. Fisher has stated. If you have any questions about the Neighborhood Council notification process, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you. And um, before we hear from the other public speakers, any other comments, colleagues? I just know uh, Ms. Jackson has an experience <laughs> in former council deputy. How many years have you been in the city of Los Angeles? Uh, 34. So do you feel that there's been outreach? Uh, maybe and everything's perfect, but you feel there's been outreach Absolutely. on these issues. And we also are inhibited by the state law. Yes, we are. And has anybody sponsored anything in the city to try to change that state law? Well, I believe that Mr. Anderson, um, who is in the audience today, <clears throat> he's given me a Senate bill number that we're kind of tracking to see how this moves through the state level. And Mr. Fisher works on the um, c committee that works on these regulations. Yeah, I'm on the California Traffic Control Devices Committee, and we've held meetings over the last three years with many jurisdictions regarding the flexibility in setting speed limits. Um, I and my colleagues on the committee are meeting with uh, Caltrans uh, Director Kempton and Commissioner of the California Highway Patrol Commissioner Farrow on February 24th to directly uh, advise them on um, why, why we feel we need a little bit more flexibility in how we set those speed limits. And uh, so we will be meeting with them to discuss that. But what I can say is that although we would be advocates for a little bit more flexibility, that flexibility that we would ask would not change our proposal here. I got that. Maria, if there's anything I need to do to write uh, to support I, Mr. You Peter. may have, I don't know if you, before you got here, we talked about that we wanted to get a legislation sponsored mm -hmm. that would allow us to have urban different than rural because there's a big difference between uh, some of the things that are happening in, in those areas so we can make sure we coordinate. Municipalities that. over 2 million people, that's it. Los Angeles and everybody else, or something like that. Thank, thank you. Uh, if not, we'll, if you'd let, we'll just have the two speakers come up, Arisha Smolarski and James Anderson. Excuse me. 
Hi, Hi. my name is Arisha Smolarski, and I'm with the LA County Bicycle Coalition. Um, I just want to bring up that anytime you raise um, traffic um, uh, controls and the speeds, thank you, you are affecting actually all users. And I think that it's really important that we don't forget that there are other users on the road besides vehicles, that there are pedestrians and there are bicycles. And so when you're raising speeds, you're actually making it a lot more uh, dangerous for cyclists to use that thoroughfare. So I'd really like you to consider that when, uh, and to actually keep speeds lower, making the neighborhood safer, making it safe, safer for multimodal transportation, and not, again, catering to only vehicular drivers and I think our concern, we have the same interests. The challenge is that um, in enforcement because of the state law, um, if the average, these speed surveys we do, unless we raise it that amount that, to that five, um, the officers can't enforce it. And so now you have a lot of people who are breaking the speed greater than the five miles per hour. Without this speed limit, you know, again, it's a kind of a catch, unfortunately, a circular argument in some ways. but. They can't use radar at all, and so the only way that they could catch someone going over the speed limit would be by tracking them. Um, and uh, our valley traffic and others have come to us and said, we don't have the personnel to be able to do that because you literally have to get behind them like you do. A highway patrol has to get behind them and follow them for a certain distance. So the hope is we would get them people to slow down greater than that they're driving now and, and some of those areas where there may be concern. But it is kind of antithetical to all of us. So we'd like to actually see that we could bring it down even more but get the state legislation. Thank you. I'm Jim Anderson, Chairman of the Public Safety Committee in Woodland Hills. And uh, no, I haven't been contacted by LAPD concerning this, nor have I been contacted by the council's office, but I have two questions for you. Uh, one is the valuation of life versus money. Is it worthwhile to raise the speed limit to enforce them, to gain more money for the city? I can vouch, I'm a walker. I'm one of the few in Woodland Hills. You can make more money enforcing the red light law in Woodland Hills than you're gonna make on speeding. And finally, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Chief, but your cruisers, LAPD cruisers say, to protect and to serve. What part of protection is covered by raising the speed limits? Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, yes. the, we're not raising the speed of the cars. In fact, it is the behavior pattern of the cars that is forcing us to change the sign. The cars are driving this fast. The question is whether uh, we can enforce the law. We can enforce the law against them. And and also we have the state that is, is saying that you can't enforce the law against them unless you do Speed the survey. properly uh, the, the survey. So number one, the cars are driving past now. <coughs> uh, number two, we can get better control of the cars by doing the survey, the survey says that we must raise the speed limit in order to enforce the law. It's, it's, it's one of the weirdest things that I have ever encountered in city government. Who, who wrote this, the survey and these regulations? No, it's, 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 it's rational if you, if you follow it, uh, but it's, it's one of the weirdest things to be able to understand and appreciate. But who wrote the, these regulations? This is, these are state law. As of when? Historically, going back to small towns having regulations at 25 mile an hour off Highway 99, and they would write tickets. Traps. You know, when you're driving up the coast and some little town puts a 25 mile an hour speed zone in an area where everybody's driving 50 miles so that they can uh, fulfill their budgetary needs. Um, and so, I, I think uh, you might be sensitive to that sort of issue. Uh, in, on today's agenda, but, but that's, it's exactly the same scenario. The, the fact is that the, the city of Los Angeles, by raising the speed limit, not increasing the speed of the cars, because they're already driving fast, but by raising the speed limit, we feel we can get better control of the car. And you don't think that they're just gonna say, oh look, now it's a little bit higher, so I can even drive faster. Well, if they do, we can cite them. But fine. before we could, well, we could cite them, but they would meet it in court. Thank you.
you both very much for being here. What I'd, what I'd like to do, um, and with everything being said on both sides about the, what seems that there maybe should be one other meeting with the Woodland Hills group um, discussion um, to happen uh, before it comes to council. So uh, John, I will look to you, John, if you will at least arrange something before those items that are within the Woodland Hills Neighborhood Council to sit down with some of the representatives that are here today and LAPD prior to it coming to council. Okay. And, and we'll look forward to a report back on the um, on legislation that we'd like to see changed. So um, that would have before us item one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven um, with those that are in the Woodland Hills area that not be scheduled in council until there's a, a meeting that can be held, um, an informal meeting with representatives who are here today from the Woodland Hills area with LAPD and with the Department of Transportation. Okay. okay. Um, Madam Chair, then, then, then they're all approved with that stipulation. But uh, item number ten, uh, we're going to hold. I, I, we're going to have item ten next. We do have another card other than Mr. Jacob Berger who is here, so um, we're just going to hear that real quick. Uh, I did say ten first, but question for you: Not all of them are in Woodland Hills. Only those that are Woodland Hills related. All right. Okay. Okay. Pass that to his consent. Okay, colleagues. That will be the item. For which one? Item ten. one through one through seven are moved on consent. Seven, approved. and those will not. The, the, those that are specifically for Woodland Hills area will not go to council until uh, transportation and the Woodland Hills members have had a chance to meet with um, LAPD as well. Okay. Okay. If we could just go to item ten, um, we had we had two speaker cards, um, Damian Newton as well as Je Jeffrey Jacobberger. And if I can, um, Madam Chair, there was a request from um, staff that we uh, amend the recommendation to um, increase the total amount from 113,000 to 119,000, give that 6,000 to street services. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Jeffrey. Uh, Jeff Jacoberger, uh, I'm the chair of the Transportation, Parking, and Streetscape Committee of the Mid City West Community Council, um, which is a neighborhood council that covers the area. Um, that is um, encompassed within the Grove Neighborhood Traffic Mitigation Plan. And at our board meeting last night, uh, we voted 30 to 0 to support uh, this plan. Uh, we've been working with the council offices and DOT for, I think, over three years on this and would really like to see it move forward and have these measures implemented. I would just add, you know, one of the frustrations in our neighborhood is this plan is limited to improvements on the, you know, residential streets. And one of the real problems in our neighborhood, as Councilman LaVange you know, knows, is, you know, the traffic on the main streets, especially Fairfax and the intersection of 3rd and Fairfax. And what would really help our neighborhood is if we can find a way to find a solution um, at that intersection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I live about a mile from the uh, – I won't need a time limit. I'll, I live about a mile from the uh, the Grove Farmer's Market area. And while I'd like to echo his comments that 3rd and Fairfax is one of the worst intersections I've ever seen in my life, um, there's actually a fair amount of people that know about this plan in the neighborhood actually really like it. I mean, there's some out there on it because – those residential streets, remember also to the, a large area to the east of the Grove, there's a large Orthodox Jewish community, which, you know, several days a week and other days of the year doesn't use cars at all. Uh, and improving pedestrian issues on those streets is, is a really big deal uh, and something that a lot of people are really excited about. So I just wanted to say that uh, on the community level, the people I know and talk to, which is pretty diverse in the area that I happen to live in, uh, there's a lot of excitement and uh, I guess we're all happy we don't live in the valley, and it's uh, now now. That's just a speed limit joke. It's just no, a speed I'm west limit side. Joke. Don't get me wrong. All right. See, they, they don't, don't have the traffic. Joke. They don't have the traffic that they I have know. on the west side. I didn't want to get into Going it. Down. I just you love our You're going to defend our valley. Come on. All right. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, there's a lot of excitement about this type of stuff, and people uh, people are looking forward to it. Great. Great. Is there anyone here for the department on this item? We kind of said we were going to we were going to go forward with Glenn it. Glenn is here. Glenn, on this thing here, just at Third and Gardner. Yeah, last Sunday I was at a community meeting at Park La Brea. A person who was uh, visibly impaired wanted a signal similar to you have near the Braille Institute. There's a library there. There's a lot of seniors. Uh, what do you call the signals correctly, like you have at Melrose in Vermont? That make a little chirp. Oh, these are. Um accessible pedestrian signals for right. the blind. I look for one at Third and Gardner, if you would, please. Okay. Third and Gardner, and okay. then survey the rest of Third Street to Fairfax. 
uh, thank the community. It has been a long, long time. There are some limits to the challenges of uh, street circulation at 3rd and Fairfax due to his buildings and whatever the case may be there. We're constantly looking for ways to improve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. I know you you both uh, share, you and Mr. Weiss share that area. So um, if no other questions. Uh, we will approve item number 10. Thank you guys for being As amended. Here. As amended, thank you. Yes, with the six additional six thousand. And did you, and did you put the, the crosswalk uh, chirp in that report? Is that the smart crosswalk? That's item eleven. The one for for the Grove area. I just want to make sure, Glenn. I got it. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. We go to the next item. Item number eight is a DOT report relative to the collection expenditure of transportation mitigation funds. This is ten. Eight. Good afternoon, Jay Kim from the uh, Department of Transportation, uh, joined by Pauline Chan uh, from DOT as well. Uh, this is a DOT report on uh, how to best expend the collected developer trip fees in a timely fashion so that it doesn't become subject to the State uh, Mitigation Fee Act and we have to actually return the money back to the developers. Uh, the report is actually broken down into uh, two parts. Uh, the first one deals with just the typical developer trip fees that we collect. And the second part is how we do, deal with uh, the collected uh, neighbor traffic management funds we also uh, typically uh, extract from developers. Uh, there's actually three types of fees that we collect from developers. Uh, first is the application fee uh, and traffic study review fees. Those are not subject to the, uh, the Mitigation Fee Act. And so we don't have to worry about uh, finding ways to expend those funds. However, the trip fees that we collect, uh, they are subject to uh, the Mitigation Fee Act. And in reviewing our fund balances and looking at the past history of when the monies were collected, and uh, we looked at the patterns of how we've been spending the money, and all of the four funds, if you look back at the past five years, uh, they have been in, in compliance with the Mitigation Fee Act. But however, every single year, uh, essentially, uh, you do have to allocate funds toward projects because every year, uh, if you had collected money uh, four or five years prior, well, those are coming up. And so there is a continual need to track and monitor uh, the funds, and we do have mechanisms in place to make sure that, uh, that we don't uh, lose sight of those uh, funds that may be coming up for that five-year rule. Um, so I think at this point, uh, our, our bigger challenge on the, the trip fees uh, from developers is that in certain specific plan areas where we do collect the developer trip fees, we are kind of hitting a wall because many of the, uh, the easier transportation improvements uh, within that plan area have been done and what's left on that list are typically more controversial projects which uh, require a lot more community consensus and now we're beginning to uh, kind of experience uh, much more delay in expending those funds because the project list is either dwindling because if we don't have the right of way or we, we don't have the community uh, support and so I think it's kind of time for us to really kind of evaluate how we can best come to uh, building the community consensus that's needed to move projects forward. Uh, we have many project examples where uh, we would actually leverage the funds, get outside transportation dollars, and then after we had initiated a, a, a design of the project, we would get into trouble at the 11th hour by the community, you know, who would come out and say, we didn't know about this project, why are you doing this, a lot of questions are raised, so, and then it adds a lot of time and delay. And we're hoping that we can avoid uh, that type of kind of a planning and do a lot of the outreach and community consensus building on the front end uh, so that even though it may be more effort in the beginning, we hope to be able to deliver projects faster. That also one that would be uh, uh, cognizant and, and respectful of the community uh, priorities and, and, and wishes. So uh, our recommendation is to formulate a, a trip fee expenditure committee for each of our four active uh, plan areas where we do collect trip fees. Um, and because it's a tight budget year, we didn't think that uh, having a uh, staff person dedicated to that is, you know, likely. Uh, and so we're just asking for uh, resources in, in, uh, in the form of an overtime to be able uh, to sort of respond to any kind of action items that may come out of the, the TRIFI expenditure committee. So uh, basically for the TRIFIs, again, it's the formulation of the expenditure committee and the overtime allocation. Those are our recommendations uh, from sort of the, the planning side of the department. 
in, in addition, um, I, I, I uh, see that you're asking for some other um, Department of Public Works to establish a list of qualified uh, engineer, civil, um, different kind of areas. Yeah, as well. I, I will let Pauline speak on okay. the uh, neighbor traffic management side. Okay. We'll go to Pauline then. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the council motion asks as to how we can better uh, spend the in neighborhood traffic management funds more promptly. And the council motion correctly indicated that uh, perhaps the lack of community consensus often is a deterrent to spending the funds promptly. I just want to clarify that in many cases where neighborhood traffic management funds are collected by the city, um, th these funds were collected uh, through a voluntary contribution from the developer. And only in a few cases are these funds actually required because of the need to mitigate an actual traffic impact on a residential street. So that is why one of our recommendations is to request city attorney's assistance to clarify whether in most of these cases uh, these voluntary funds may or may not be subjected to the five-year rule on spending these monies. And that would you know, give us <coughs> more opportunity to use the money. <clears throat> um, and, and then with regard to the consensus issue, I think we all agree with, it's obvious that consensus is really necessary in order to uh, decide which neighborhood traffic improvements should be made, especially in the cases where traffic restrictions are being proposed. Um, what we're saying is that after working with many neighborhoods, we find that traffic restrictions remain very controversial and it's very hard to get the majority consensus in these neighborhoods. Yet, um, when we bog ourselves down into uh, this consensus building process for a barrier or turn restriction or street closure, we lose the opportunity to use the money quickly for much more immediate um, and perhaps more uh, improvements with more impact, which are uh, neighborhood improv improvements, streetscape improvements, such as traffic circles, landscape medians, and so on. And when we get bogged down by these traffic restriction issues and not spend the money, we also forego the opportunity up front to have the developer put in these improvements more cheaply because they already have a contractor out there. Um, and so that's why in the recommendations, we have um, multiple suggestions to uh, work with the city attorney's office, to work with our city planning colleagues, to identify language for, uh, for defining voluntary neighborhood traffic management funds that could be negotiated with the developer so that they would encourage the developer to make neighborhood improvements up front, to um, allow DOT to use such funds to implement streetscape and pedestrian improvements that would also have some impact on driver behavior through these neighborhoods and lessen the impact of the traffic, to perhaps impose time limits on public out outreach and consensus for traffic restrictions so that after a certain time frame, six months a year, if there's no consensus reach, that gives us some authority to go ahead and spend the money on, na on streetscape improvements. Um, and then uh, lastly, when consensus uh, is, is uh, achieved for a streetscape project, we can um, then have establish a list now to have qualified traffic engineering or civil in and or civil engineering consultants to help us design these streetscapes and to establish an as-needed vendor's uh, list to build these streetscape projects because our understanding is our colleagues in the Department of Public Works are overwhelmed with their workload and are unable to respond to uh, these uncertain schedules of uh, approved neighborhood traffic management plans and public consensus processes. Lastly, we're also asking that we get authority for, to backfill a vacant uh, Transportation Engineering Associate three position because of the lack of staffing resources in our neighborhood traffic management program. Um, I'm sure you know that this um, process of doing consensus building, doing uh, feasibility studies for traffic calming measures, doing opinion surveys with communities, et cetera, are very time consuming and very labor intensive. And that is why we need this. And we, we wish to improve the rate at which we accomplish these plans um, 
so that we can promptly expend these funds. Just a, a couple of quick questions on that. So you, you're requesting $50,000 from each trust fund for four years? No. Uh, let me just What's clarify. The total? Um, th there's four, there are four active trust fund areas, and we're sort of saying that for each uh, plan area, there will be a separate uh, expenditure committee, and basically you're allocating $50,000 uh, each year um, so that if there are activities generated uh, at the direction of the committee, that there would be uh, staff resources to be able to sort of carry out those uh, activities, including conceptual design uh, preparation, or if you have grant application opportunities, uh, or just going out to the community and actually trying to build a, a community consensus on, uh, you know, what are the things that the community wishes to sort of, you know, uh, is implement. It, is it, it 50,000 from Coastal, 50,000 from West LA, 50,000 yes, from Yes, from each one. Each one, okay. That was, that was my question. Um, <clears throat> and the reason we introduced this motion was because we found there was a lot of money in those pots that we didn't, we were not aware of. Um, I know the largest amount Mr. Rosendahl has in his district, um, the coastal area, for a variety of, of reasons uh, for some of those issues. And what we want to do is not have them sit there. I mean, for me, it's having the community involved in an early side, literally from the time we think they're going to the allocated funds when they're required to put in those funds that we talk to the community then and set up that committee per se. Um, and I'm not sure I'm ready to, to go with... 50,000 for the next four years. I mean, there's a lot of things that isn't it for the next four years. Yeah, well, well, for the four trust funds, I'm sorry, 50,000 for each of the four trust funds, not for the next four years, just for this next year. Um, At this point. Yes, I guess we can come back and, and request for each uh, fiscal year. Okay. Can, can the money be used for this purpose? It's, if it's related, it's related specifically to that yes, plan. Yes, the money is eligible for uh, planning purposes. I know Mr. Rosendahl has used it for planning purposes yeah. in his district. On it's been a big deal for me. Let me have, go through a series of questions just for the record first, okay? Uh, please explain the main purpose of the trip fee expenditure committee. Explain mm -hmm. it. Well, ag again, uh, in many uh, plan areas, uh, what we're running up against is, uh, to give an example, in your district, uh, we had a project, the Sepulveda Whiting Project. Right. Uh, and when it was... Uh, proposed, it was on the books, it was a legitimate project yep. uh, for the trip fees to be expended on. We actually leveraged our, the trip uh, fee funds and got MTA grant. Uh, and we had a project all ready to go, right. designed the project, came out to the community, and community was in an uproar basically saying, why are you doing this? Right. Uh, and so I think that was kind of the old model where we just followed what was on the list. Right. We did what we were told to do, right. but then you know, because a lot of these plans were uh, kind of uh, uh, created maybe 20 years ago, and the priorities of the communities and the wishes have changed. And so uh, I think that was kind of our lesson was rather than going out and getting caught at the 11th hour uh, with a lot of opposition, our attempt here now is to work with the community, work with council offices, and work at the front end so that there is clear mandate and priority, because even though you have a list of projects, Right. There is no set priority on these. It's just sort of free for all whenever you can get the money for. So we're trying to be proactive in trying to create this committee and trying to get that early buy-in so that we don't get the huge opposition uh, at the tail end of the project. Makes a lot of sense. And in my community, as you know, there's quite an interest in that. Yes. That goes on. Second question. Will this serve to include public opinion in our transit projects and programs? Yeah. A lot of the funds are uh, eligible for uh, transit improvement projects. So this is a great opportunity. Uh, if you look at the list of improvement projects right. uh, in the specific plans, yeah. there's a lot of street, street widening projects uh, that are uh, specifically listed, but they also mention uh, allowable expenditures on transit, on uh, uh, managing people's you know, uh, behavior. Yeah. But again, those are not as well defined, even though they're eligible a project category. So this committee could, for example, take the new direction especially in light of um, all the climate change, uh, right. you know, concerns, rather than focusing on, say, just capacity, you may want to invest, as you have also uh, alluded in your other motions about trying to look at uh, other rail options, you could spend the money and looking at those different types of uh, transportation solutions. So, again, the committee could play a, a very large role in sort of setting a new direction. 
appreciate that, too. And does the already established EIR process not allow for adequate public input and opinions? How does it work with the EIR? Um, there, there still is going to be uh, an EIR prepared for each uh, project. So after we would uh, develop a concept plan, uh, it would still have to undergo a, a CEQA clearance process. Uh, and, you know, it may be, uh, it may come back as, you know, mitigated negative declaration, uh, but there is still a process, and the public will still get to participate. It's just that we're, again, trying to build a wide uh, community consensus before we even embark and waste a lot of energy on some of these projects. Uh, if we hand over 50000 each fiscal year to these four funds, which is a total of 200000 uh, for how many years will the department uh, need this extra money for overtime? Uh, we could begin uh, this year, and I think what we could do is we can come back to you with how the committee full formation occurred, what were the expenditure activities that came out of it, and based on our sort of initial uh, year's worth of work, we can always come back and adjust uh, as necessary for the subsequent years. And at some point, like in your district, yeah. uh, Mr. Rosendahl, uh, you are also in the process of updating the plan. Right. So in a couple of years, you know, in a way, this kind of work already could have been taken care of. So different plan areas will probably require different amount of resources over time, and we can come back each year and kind of make adjustments for that. That's fair enough, too. What specific tasks and goals are we to expect from staff if we give you this money? Uh, what I see staff doing is if there is a clear uh, consensus on, for example, uh, from that list, if the community uh, and the uh, council offices come back and say, you know, we want you to work on ABC first, we would then develop concrete conceptual plans uh, and do cost estimates and do all the things that are that would be necessary for us to then begin to seek outside funding. So the minute that we uh, have an opportunity when MTA has their call for projects, rather than scrambling at the last minute trying to put an application together, we would actually have a plan estimate ready to go. And usually projects that are well thought out have that type of uh, consensus built in they always do better. And so again, it just puts the project in a better position to be able to uh, obtain future uh, right funding. Me too. And let me just go back to a few more questions. What specific tasks and goals um, are we to expect from staff if we give you this money? And does DOT have staff assigned to work on these projects now? If so, what is the funding mechanism? No, we don't have staff assigned to these projects. That's the reason why we're asking for the overtime resources, and because it is a lot of extra work. And the specific task would be preparing those conceptual plans, preparing cost estimates, uh, actually doing the grant applications themselves, and also, uh, you know, attending meetings, public outreach meetings, uh, and trying to build that consensus. Again, a lot of it is, could be very time consuming, and I think it'll vary plan by plan. Some areas will have more activity, others might be easier to build that consensus. So, uh, we were just trying to cover ourselves so that we can get started on this kind of a new process of planning for the future. Okay, that's a good point. The accounts that we, we now have, the four listed in this report, were they established by ordinance? Yes, they were all established by ordinance. And if so, is DOT proposing that we amend them in order to change or expand upon the priorities and programs that are already listed in these ordinances? No, there is enough flexibility, I believe. Uh, again, there are broad categories that you can expend the money. The specific projects are not always identified. So we could work within those broad categories to develop very specific projects that address uh, the regional mobility needs, but again, but one that could uh, respect, uh, you know, the quality of life issues for the neighborhoods. Just the last set of questions has to do with the coastal uh, temp update. Um, and I look at mine, of course, all the time in here. The Green Line, the Lincoln uh, Corridor yes. Task Force, the Livable Boulevards, Poverty Boulevard, as you mentioned, uh, and the West LA Rail linkage. The new position at DOT to oversee this update uh, will also lead to the coordination of those projects, right? Correct. Okay. And the question is, does DOT need more money uh, to finish working on this project? or something else entirely? Has the necessary staff been hired? Uh, on the, on the, your prior motions? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, we made the request for the uh, position authority. It was approved by council, uh, and it was also approved by uh, CAO's office. But because of the new uh, the, the hiring management uh, policy, uh, I believe now uh, even our request for that position still has to go to that committee 
uh, before it can be fully approved. So we would ask for your support, uh, making sure that those concerns are relayed to that particular uh, hiring committee. Before this goes to council, is it possible that you could sit with my staff and go over sure. the fine points on this in case there's any confusion? Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I know, Mr. Parks, you had a quick question, though. I've got a quick question. Let me just ask stuff clear on the 50000 per fund per year. Is the game plan to come back each year, or are you looking for multi-year approval today? Uh, since this is a first-year attempt, uh, it might be better if we, uh, again, uh, eat, went through, and perhaps after our first-year experience, yeah. we can come back and say, it looks like we may continue this kind of work for the next couple of years, and we can come one back for it. year at a time. No. Or, you know, it could be one year at a time. It, um, first-year experience is $200,000. Yeah, but again, we may not expend all of it. I'm saying, but that's what you would like, the allocation. Yes, that would give us, uh, uh, I think, enough resources to be able to respond to any kind of activities that may be generated by the committee. Okay, and then clarify the position. Are you still seeking the position, or have you put that aside? For the NTM funds, which, which is separate from the, the developer trip fees, mm -hmm. uh, to expend the monies for, for that purpose, Yes, there is a request to backfill yeah, a vacancy. For one right. authority? Yes, for, uh, for one, one position. We're requesting authority to do a backfill. That is for the, uh, to help with implementing the neighborhood traffic management okay. project. But that's uh, annually, or are you just talking for this fiscal year, next fiscal year? In the year? recommendation, we're asking for authority for the remainder of this year. This and year. to requesting that this authority be continued for next year. And, and then what was the source of funds for that? It would, we we're proposing to use um, portions from uh, the NTM allowance from the West LA TIMP fund, the NTM allowance from the Coastal Corridor fund, and then the rest, uh, and another one third, from the Neighborhood Traffic Management fund. Okay, so they're a, a part of those same four funds, or is it a fifth fund? Three funds. Four. Yeah, it's two, two are from the four funds. Okay, all right. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sort of interested in the whole theory of this uh, process. And the, the theory uh, is developers uh, want to develop projects. Um, the negative impacts from their projects cannot be um, fully mitigated all at once because uh, the mitigations uh, would involve other uh, potential developments. Um, but essentially, this fund is a mitigation fund. It's a fund to deal with the cumulative uh, impacts of projects. So, e so if we don't, if we don't do the mitigations, does that mean that the original project um, has a negative impact? No. Uh, basically, uh, the original project is required to, to do two things. They still have to undergo the sequel process and analyze their own traffic impacts and fully mitigate their own traffic impacts. The fee is collected for the purpose of looking at kind of the, the combined uh, effects of development uh, over time and the cumulative impacts it would have on the regional network. And so that study was done years back, and then you develop a fee. So every new project that comes online sort of pays their share. But in order to charge the fee, we must, there must be a nexus between the benefit. Yes, that nexus study was done before, so and if he was doing the benefit, then we're not mitigating the cumulative negative effects. Uh, but we are. I mean, we we have used these funds to uh, to create and actually implement uh, projects, and so and the nexus study that you were referring to was done in years prior be, when the fee was established, and so it's already been taken care of. And now we're in the stage of collecting the fees and creating projects and actually implementing those projects that were originally on that list to do. Okay. So the, the projects that you list uh, are not necessarily specific. They can be general. It's a mix. Uh, there are some specific uh, intersection improvements that may be listed. Other times uh, there's a broad category. It will say that you can spend it on transit or transportation demand management programs. It doesn't tell you how to, it's not that prescriptive. Uh, so it's a combination of both. 
broad programs as well as very specific projects. And, and quite often uh, those broader projects rely on uh, streams of income from many, many other projects. Yes. Potential projects. Yes. And, and we can't uh, do the mitigation because those other projects don't have. For example, in this economy, there's been a tremendous slowdown in the development, so we're not anticipating getting a lot of fees, right? Uh, yes, and it, it you know goes up and down, but so that would slow our, slow our time frame down. Yeah, we're not we're not under any kind of a uh, like a project delivery schedule mandate. It, it's kind of like whenever we have enough money and and the money that we collect. I thought is we all had a five-year window to get them done. Yes, and and since we have the money, all we're trying to do is make sure that we do uh, program it within that five-year window to make sure that it's going toward a real okay, so project. When, is, when does the five-year window begin and when does it end? The minute that you collect the money, the clock starts ticking. Who's the, and you collect the money at what point? Well, when a developer, let's say, uh, you know, wants to get their building permit, they come in, they pay so a the fee. Point they get their permit, then right. you collect the money. We collect the money. That five-year clock starts right. and the, it ends when... Well, it, it ends if, if we didn't allocate that money toward a project or spend it before then, right. then it is subject to a possible refund. At what point? Uh, but if, just the but that hasn't really occurred. I mean, we've, we've had enough okay. activity on creating real projects. Are there any projects where we're close? Uh, yeah, every year, you know, it sometimes becomes close. So, like, Is, we might have one year where there was a large uh, deposit made by one developer. Okay. And unless you had a big project five years later to spend that money, you could potentially run into that kind of trouble. So it's our job to kind of make sure that you keep an eye on it and, and you kind of flag a certain amount of money, you know, before it gets too late. Do you think, do you think it would uh, be any benefit, uh, given uh, the reality of today's economy and, uh, and the complexity of, of urban centers, uh, at the increasing complexity of urban centers, to expand that time frame? Oh, well, it's a state law. We can't change the uh, time frame. But, nah. but, but you, you could, but the state law does allow. Change the state law. Yeah, but uh, you, you so, could, you, uh, yes, you I could I do go that. back to my original question. Okay. Would it be beneficial to expand the five-year period? Might it be worthy of being part of our legislative agenda to expand the window from five years to seven years? I think it's worthy because we're experiencing more and more project delivery times are more complicated by the fact that we don't have the right of way. Uh, it, it is difficult to build consensus. Then so you're what correct. I would suggest is that you work with uh, the mayor's office and the CLA to see if that's worthy of finding a sponsor. And, and, and the other point I wanted to make is that within the current rules, it's either you expend within five years or you just have to allocate it towards a project. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend it all within five years. Okay. As long as you allocate it within five. That was the question yeah. I forgot to ask. So and there I is some flexibility built in already. I think Richard's point is well taken because they have done some state law that changed track map, you know, other things that have been extended to deal with the economy. Even and if it's temporary, right now yeah. we're not going to get a lot of projects. Yeah. So, so some of the funds are under that five year, others are not, and the potential that could be used. To, oh, good, good idea. Still a bunch. I just want to say publicly, Pauline Chan is one of the finest employees of the city of Los Angeles. And Jay Kim does a very great job as well. I just want to compliment you both. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask is you said there's four work areas that you have. I know uh, then I think of Commander Parks and then when I was working for John, we was a commander that we met. We talked about jurisdictions. You know, there's, there's four. Does your jurisdiction match the Bureau of Engineering's jurisdiction or does it match other jurisdictions, are your lines for how you divide the city by four consistent with other like departments? Or would you know that? Could you repeat that question? The city has boundaries. Yes. There's the city. Then they have council district boundaries. They have police boundaries, their bureaus, their divisions. You have a, a, a central area. A valley area, a west area, a south area? Yes, it's uh, different for within the pl uh, Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. depending on the bureau. Right. Uh, we are set up differently. Uh, this is not an action, but would you think it would be consistent if we all kind of tried to have the same areas in some way or form? I mean, it would be nice to be consistent because you're working with the same, but that's a dream, Maria, that I want to see fulfilled. 
<laughs> right, right. Well, we can move on that. Fifteen ge geographic. No, no. I just think that the, the Bureau of Engineering, which I think has four jurisdictions, should be the same. You know, a like area should be the same. But we'll work with you on that. The other thing uh, I just wanted to say is again, thank you for trying to implement this important program. And I think we get behind when we forget what's there. So to be as transparent as possible and that information is out there will help us move forward to do mitigation. I know the people of the Mid-City West, Mid-City, Fairfax Village District were very patient uh, and they want to see action and that's why I think other parts of the city want to see action. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. We do have two public speaker cards you can take. Is it two, uh, Kathy Daladani and Jim Anderson? Come on up, Jim. Kathy's been a hard worker on this Ventura Boulevard specific plan, which was the impetus for all of this. this Kathy Deladani, a president of the uh, Ventura Coanga specific plan review board. I don't want to say I'm upset, but I'm disappointed in the lack of communication. Uh, we are we are really the the plan review board is the overseer of the 523. Um, I have initiated. Uh, you know, I am trying to establish communication with DOT. Uh, a couple of months back, I initiated a, uh, a meeting with Sean Harry, uh, project manager for the short-term improvements for Ventura Boulevard that was approved a number of months ago. Uh, Mr. Kim was supposed to be there too, but he had another obligation at the time. I spoke to Sean at length because I wanted to get, bring back uh, to the board a status of what is happening on the short term. Sean was very good in every, you know, in that regard. He explained about, for instance, on the Woodland Hills, there was a problem. I offered, you talk about consensus, I offered, uh, I said I would bring it up to the board. Our, our uh, appointee from Woodland Hills could work with the neighborhood council and hopefully get a consensus on that uh, widening project. Uh, I have heard, I came across this report the end of last week. I knew nothing about it. Uh, I, uh, I emailed Sean Harry and I said, you know, well, what about this report? Is this the one you had indicated that you were involved in writing? Um, also, what is happening with the short-term imp improvements? And I haven't heard from him yet, and whether he's, maybe he's on vacation or what. I'm sorry, may I, may I respond to that? Actually. The, yeah, we'll hold uh, our time. Go ahead. Um, the next item, I believe, uh, it's item 11, uh, actually uh, is speaking directly to your questions about the progress. And we're actually allocating monies to start, begin, uh, start the design work. And item 11 is really uh, to uh, take the prior authorization on the fund expenditure. And we're asking the money be uh, uh, moved to the salaries and overtime accounts so that DOT engineers and, and other uh, city department uh, staff could begin to uh, do the design work on the short-term uh, improvements. Now, this is not what I understood. I, mean, I don't want to start an argument back and forth. This is not what Sean from our meeting that, w that it was supposed to the design work, the money was supposed to be transferred over to, to uh, and the staff was to begin work on the design projects ASAP and that there would be six months in the design, six months in the uh, bid uh, avenue, and then uh, probably and then, and then into the uh, actual improvements. So which he estimated about 18 months from start to finish. Okay. It looks like there's not been the communication, you know, okay. from that to communication. What I'd like to make sure happens is before this, both this item and item 11 goes forward to council. Um, that we that you all sit down in the same room so that there's an understanding again that was part of the the challenge I know with all of these funds is to make sure you've got the community involved but you can actually lessen your time if the community is involved from 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 the beginning communicate with what I would like to do is to bring this before the plan review board at our next meeting on February 3rd okay and I would just ask that this committee can you hold off on on doing anything with this particular issue, this agenda item, until I bring it before the committee and have a clear, you know, an explanation as far as what it, it actually, you know, more of the particulars of the. Of if the, we do kind of meet you halfway, Kathy, just that and all that uh, um, short time we have in February and all of that as far as meetings. If we move this forward to council, but it not get scheduled until oh, you've had your meeting, Madam, and then there are any other issues, we can resolve it. 
this is also going to the Planning and Land Use Committee okay. and Personnel Committee before it goes to Council, so we do have okay. a ways before it ultimately makes it. So, but we will. I will make sure that before it's on the Council calendar, that we have had the conversation. The conversations have occurred prior to that. Okay. Um, so we won't hold it in committee, but it will go to the other two, and we'll make sure um, that you're noticed of the other two when it goes to four. But hopefully, before it goes to Plum and to Personnel, you'll have a chance to review it as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I'm still Jim Anderson. Yes. <clears throat> the funds referred to in here are connected with the Warner Center specific plan and specifically the Neighborhood Protection Plan. Funds were generated a long time ago. We don't know exactly when. We've never seen a penny of it. We don't know where it's sequestered. There is a requirement that annually DOT planning LAFD and LAPD submit a report, as I said, annually. I have never seen one. So I have one question. Why shouldn't these funds be audited by the city auditor to determine where they are and how much there is there? Finally, as far as the neighborhood protection plan goes and traffic mitigation goes, which is what it says it's set aside for to get traffic off of our neighborhood streets and onto major arterials, Nothing like that has been accomplished. DOT stood in front of us at one of our council hearings and admitted that they have a physically irreconcilable gridlock at the intersection of the 101 and Topanga Canyon Boulevard. That's simple. They can't do anything about it. So where does the traffic go? goes on my street. goes on streets south of the boulevard and north of the boulevard. The Neighborhood Protection Plan covers parts of Winnetka, parts of Canoga and parts of West Hills, as well as south to Dumetz. It is not limited to Warner Center. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And, and as I mentioned, I know Kathy knows this because we've dealt with it, but that the reason we did this motion and to have this report from the first place was that we found out we had $5 million, and we didn't know that in the area, um, and, and so was to try to jumpstart that to have the discussion because uh, we felt it was important to do that. And so this is your... Uh, your questions and, and so forth, are, are uh, that's part of what this needs to be answered, and that's why we move forward. So thank you, Jim. I second what Kathy said. Too. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And Mr. Parks, so on the one question, did you ask Mr. Parks the question about the position? Yeah, they're coming out of this. Two of these funds and one third. Okay. So I think the personnel committee will be looking at the authority that the funds are not general funds. Okay. okay. They're special funds. Okay. So, um, and again, so we'll, we'll look to hear from you all that you've met with the interested parties between now and the time it goes to council. Okay. All right, that'll be the order. Thank you very much. We're going to take item number 12 next. Item number 12 is a LAP, uh, Los Angeles Police Commission report in response to a reassigned motion relative to the city's bicycle licensing program. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> Excuse me. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson and uh, committee members. I'm Deputy Chief Sergio Diaz, LAPD Operations Central Bureau. With me is Lieutenant Jerry Rodriguez from the Office of Operations. Uh, Lieutenant Rodriguez was instrumental in completing the report that was uh, transmitted via the uh, Board of Police Commissioners. Uh, essentially, in 2007, the City Council asked that LAPD report on the status of the department's bicycle licensing uh, program. In uh, completing this, this research, we uh, essentially learned that uh, throughout the city, the, the bicycle licensing program was defunct. Uh, it's a program that was designed to be administered at each of the area stations. Uh, each station was doing things a little bit differently, different hours, and uh, many places in the desk, uh, officers hadn't seen a bicycle license, and, and the uh, community relations officers who were responsible for replenishing the the licenses uh, were unaware of how to do that. Um, uh, essentially, the, the, the program was was defunct. We looked at uh, at or attempted to look at how many citations had been issued by our department for bicycles being operated on the street without city licenses. Uh, our information uh, technology people told us five, but we have no confidence in that number. We we don't know if that's the case. Uh, we recognize that uh, uh, from time to time, at, uh, different officers may make it a priority or, or to, to cite 
for this section uh, at the same time that that uh, we have essentially made it very difficult for people to uh, uh, to obtain a bicycle license. So uh, where we're at right now is uh, you know the, the the report on the status of the program has been uh, transmitted to the city council to your committee, uh, and we're in the process of writing a moratorium document, essentially directing our officers uh, until further uh, until this is further developed. Uh, they should not be riding for uh, riding citations for, for bicycles operated without a license. We don't have a whole lot of evidence that they're riding those citations anyway, but uh, but it is inherently unfair to uh, to write those citations if we don't really offer people the opportunity to obtain the license in a consistent way. So this, the, the recommendation is to um, not have a bicycle licensing program in the city and that the officers not, and therefore not... Uh, um, institute anything that violation of Well, the recommendation is that if there is going to be a bicycle licensing program, that it be outside of the LAPD. We've looked at uh, different cities and how they've, they've done it, and uh, there's a variety of ways. But frankly, one of the things we found out, too, is that the goals of a bicycle licensing program really can be achieved by other means. Uh, that is, for example, we can determine whether if the owner keeps records of uh, their serial number or engraves uh, a, a unique identifier on the bicycle, you know, we can we can get a, a stolen bicycle back to its rightful owner. Uh, we have no evidence that uh, the bicycle license uh, has ever um, has ever assisted in the identification of a of a person who's injured in a bicycle accident, for example. Again, there are other ways to achieve those same uh, those same means. So. We certainly would recommend that if, the, if a city bicycle licensing program is to continue, that it would be done outside of the police department where uh, we have other priorities and, and, uh, and we think it's, it's not uh, an intelligent use of, of the time of police officers to be issuing these licenses. Mr. Rose, another question why we have maybe uh, well, I'm very department pleased by this because, frankly, uh, Michelle Murray, can you come up to you? We talked about this at a meeting or two ago, and I kind of raised those questions about the consistency, selective enforcement, the confusion, and in some bicyclist people's minds, harassment and, and all of these issues, and it was really painful to hear it all. So I was very happy to hear that you come back with this. I'd just love to know, Michelle, your reaction to all this at this point. I agree with PD that they don't have the resources to administer it. If the city is to continue a program, we will need to have a database for licensing. Whoever sells it, we still will have to maintain a database that LAPD is involved with in some way, shape, or form, either to recover stolen bicycles or deal with injured parties. So if we determine that another department is going to get this responsibility, PD will still have an active role in the RNI and recovery issue, and the officer on the street does need to be able to find out the, if the injured cyclist can be identified through that license. Okay, the Bicycle Bill of Rights that we've been working on as a strategy, which we strongly believe in, um, does this have any relationship to that in your mind? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. They're separate. Yes. What about what happened to Mandeville Canyon? And there was concerns um, from pedestrians as well as homeowners that the bicyclists aren't identifiable. The bicycle licenses, uh, the indicia that's developed by the state, yeah. which is we're required to use per the CVC, would not help in that scenario because it's very small. It's essentially two postage stamps. So that's not going to help Mandeville Canyon residents or anybody else identify a bicycle. They're looking for an automobile-sized license plate that they can use, and that's not currently available to us through the state. Yeah. So what's your recommendation? I think we should disband the program. Most of the, progressive, most of the progressive cities that are bicycle friendly have already done so. I don't think we have the resources to do it, and I'd, I'd like to see it. If we're going to look for other ways to do this, uh, safety education programs for kids or something like that, that we administer it in that direction. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Obunch. And then we do. Does your department sell parking permits? Don't you have offices I'm, around? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, not willing to totally person. give it up. I, I want to know, does any city, you say bicycle-friendly cities, does any city administer, have you looked at the uh, National League of Cities or California uh, League of been, Cities? Have you looked at any of the other cities in the country? I have looked. Or at, what happens in Europe, in any of the uh, metropolitan areas? I, I don't what know. What do they do? Okay, you ready for we me? We have sister cities, so we could help you there, too. I know there's an interest in trying to get it out of the police department. The only disappointment I have the police department, sometimes you get away from the core 
what traditionally has been it, but I know it's an ever-changing area, so I don't want to contest the chief's wisdom or the lieutenant. But you sell permits, right? You sell permits to park, right? You could do it online, right? I believe the What if the money went to the bike program? What if it went to a bike program? I'm just saying, what if there was a way to look at it? I'm not ready to... Maybe we, we, we end it with the idea that Temporally we study, suspend it. suspend it, that's a good idea, but then just look to see and maybe work with the bike community to see if it's there. I would know as a parent, in which my son, who's 10 years old, rides his bike to school with a helmet, the, the license on the bike would mean something if on something ever happened that someone would say that's an ID that we could get to. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking. So why don't, Ms. Gruel, if you think we should suspend it, but then ask that we research it. Because you do sell permits, and there's a thing called the Internet now, I believe, right? No. Yeah. Well, let me address some of the concerns and the, the items that you've brought up. The way that the program is required per the California Vehicle Code locks us into doing things in a certain way. There are outside programs like the NICE National Bicycle Registry that allow you to buy a a private bicycle bicycle license from them. They maintain a database and do that. I th at one time, they were um, recommended by one of the lock manufacturers as a way to register your bicycle. So there are other ways to do it outside of the city. We could certainly help develop that, or we could look at um, partnering with some of those agencies. But at one time, and this has been several years now, we worked with the city attorney's office, and there are issues about the city issuing licenses and then access to the database for public information purposes. The only folks that really have access or are allowed to have access to do that are sworn personnel, and that brings us back to PD and maintaining a database, unless it's voluntary through an organization like National Bicycle Registry. So, Okay, I got it. Okay. I don't want to take any more time. kimmy has got a lot on the agenda. I think what the chair feels that we should suspend this. But well, I, don't, I mean, I think the it. question, I mean, I think that we're, they're asking for us to, re to remove it um, and see cost-benefit ratio. I think right now people are saying that benefit does not, I mean, if you had to have somebody who actually had to manage that. So I think I would go with the recommendation that's in the report. Um, do you have any other questions before we go to public comment? Yes. Yeah, just um, one of my staff members who was cited uh, for bicycle violation uh, went to court and explained he couldn't get the, get the, uh, uh, the license because um, because his schedule at school was his classes were at the same time that the hours of the office uh, selling the or the the uh, precinct that sold the the licenses was open and so the judges threw it out and you know I I'm trying to grapple with why exactly we started this in the first place I'm thinking that it had something to do with the fact that bicycles were more important in terms of um, their use like 50, 60 years ago uh, and, and much more prominent in, in the lifestyle and, and not to offend the, the bicyclists, very important to you, but I'm just saying that back then it was, it was much more critical when somebody got a bike stolen that they get it back because it was life changing or something. Um, and now uh, even with microchipping and everything else we can do theoretically, I just think this is a wonderful opportunity to cut bureaucracy at the city of Los Angeles and uh, and free the riders and and let the private sector let the let the private sector prevail. If, we, if you get a, if you get information about uh, from this national registry or something, you'll track it down. And you know, so I, let's get rid of it. And yes. and I don't want to spend it. I want to get rid of it. But, I think that's yeah. what well, the question. I mean, you know, but in all, uh, should we look at should we look at something though? No. See if other things. <laughs> no. I don't think so. So all those children who are going to encourage because they when we went to high school when we went to high school, Richard, we rode our bikes to high school. I'm sure but there's been a generation. High school? No. Uh, uh, people did. People did in my high school at Marshall High School. Whatever the case may be, more are coming back. Okay, not everybody has an identification on them. I'm just thinking there's something to, to, to see about it, whether it's a national. You could suspend it. You could end it if you want to, but I think we should think what to do. All you are experienced who are clapping out the, there, that's the, fine. The but I'm thinking for those who are not. stolen bikes. And if we can do it through some other means. No, I, I, I agree with that. But also, I don't want to just stop it without thinking totally on this. Because I, I know at times, and if it helps one person, uh, who may have a challenge, it's worth it to me. 
But it should be. I, that's a, bureaucratic. But what we can do with the we're working with the LAUSD is to how they educate their kids and the options that they have available yeah. to them. But All of that too. And when we were in school too, there were police officers uh, program in school, fire safety officers, fire. Yeah, I, actually, I actually got a bike back <laughs> that was stolen. Because of the license, but uh, because of the license. But that was that was 20 years ago. Well, wait a minute. That was that was 30 years 40 time. years ago, yeah, Richard. 30, 40 years ago. Don't try. Okay. <laughs> so we're <laughs> gonna. If you might, yeah, you want to ask a question? Yes, Mr. Parks. Wooden wheels, yes. Training wheels, actually. Training wheels. Let me just ask what? one thing. The licensing may be the, you know, the last resort, but I'm just trying to figure out if you have this national system of people being able to use it, how do you educate them, and then how available is it for the police to then access it if they find a bike? I, I is don't it on know. one of those routine checks where if they ran it, it comes through? the normal computer system? Or? That I don't know, and we would have to investigate how National Bicycle Registry communicates with PD if, if a participant reports a stolen bicycle and how that works, because I don't know. They have operated for a number of years. I don't know their current status, but we could follow up on that. Because it would seem like if we eliminated it, that it's never, in the last 30, 40 years, never worked well. But if there's a way to replace something to where the public has to make the effort so that if they can find their bike later mm -hmm. and it's accessible routinely, then it, we've solved the dilemma. But to have, you know, uh, one of the things they told us last time, I think, on serial numbers for bikes, they now don't necessarily have a number specific. It's kind of like a manufacturing number. Most most good quality bicycles over four or five hundred dollars do have serial numbers. It's the lower end. Yeah. Cheaper bikes that generally don't. And I would bet that those are the most that are stolen. Is the they are, but a lot of them aren't worth most yeah. of the value. What we can do is ask the department um, to work with both departments, DOT and LAPD, to see that there's some connection with a national program that if, if you find a bike, it's not over 500, doesn't have a serial, that you can make a call or vice versa. They can have some communication within the department. Name, and uh, this might be the time to, to reiterate what we recommend to in our meetings with the public is uh, your property that, that is serialized, it has a serial number, make note of it. If it's stolen, then report it, and it goes into our stolen property system. If it doesn't come with a serial number already, then we recommend to people and through the, uh, the station's community relations offices, we make the uh, engravers available to them so they can engrave. You know, we recommend either Social Security or... But, Really, the, uh, the driver's license or Cal ID number, and that's that's really almost a, a foolproof way of getting stolen property back to people if they take the trouble to to record it. Right. Okay. Yeah, I just so want to say one thing too, though. Whitney. I, I also, you know, we took a little bit of a heat. The neighborhood councils didn't get involved. I'm going to reach out just to get a survey of the PTSAs and the others in my district to see what they think about this program that we're going to suspend or kill and whatever we do, just to see what they think. So there's another voice out there. Okay, thank you. We're gonna ask the following people to come up. Stephen Box, David Norman, uh, Alan Alessio, uh, Russell Buchanan. And then we have two more after that as well. Good afternoon. Uh, I think we're approaching this from the wrong perspective. This isn't about recovering a bicycle as worthy uh, of a pursuit as that is. This is about ending the bike licensing program as a weapon. And so the original charge was that the enforcement of the bike license law was being used to harass cyclists, and that's something we haven't addressed. I do appreciate the opportunity for a uh, moratorium. While we're doing it, why don't we declare a moratorium on the bicycle pedal law, which we've also received tickets on. There's a specification from the old days. Keep in mind that we uh, have uh, speed trap laws from the old days. We have bicycle pedal laws from the old days. We have many laws from the old days, including a hurdy-gurdy prohibition. The point is that when these laws are used to uh, harass somebody, and I, four of us left the uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee one night. We were in Rampart Division. We made a vehicular left. A uh, police officer pulled us over and said, turning left in an intersection is an unsafe move for a cyclist. We disagreed. And that was our crime. And he said, now that you've argued with me, one of you is going to take a ticket. He searched our bikes, and Mikey Wally took a ticket for having non-reflective pedals. So if we're going to approach this topic, it would be great if we had a representative group of cyclists, such as the one before you, who could take a look at some of the laws that are just inappropriate, antiquated, old, irrelevant, useless, but are often used as a tool for uh, 
modifying the behavior of cyclists, if you will. And so I watched on New Year's Eve uh, on Hollywood Boulevard a cyclist that was in handcuffs for 17 minutes while they went through the books to find something to cite him for. He was on his way home riding on the sidewalk. But of course it's called a moving violation because he was moving. His light had been stolen. So we cited him. We didn't go looking for the person who stole his illumination. And so in this particular situation, I think the larger uh, issue for us to address is what antiquated laws should we be taking a look at so that we can enter into the modern age? Thank you very much for your consideration. And we welcome you giving us a, a list of, um, I don't know which, one, which laws those are, and we can determine whether they're state or local laws. What's that? Well, regardless, you just suggested that we revise state law when there was money at, uh, on the table. And so it's, it's a worthy thing to continue to go after state law if it's old, bad. Uh, and no, it's, uh, some of it's LA Municipal Code and some of it's CVC. Uh, but in either case, well, uh, the high class law is LA Municipal Code. The laws that Mr. Box refers to are California Vehicle Code requirements. There was an effort several years ago by the California Bicycle Coalition to introduce language to legislate change specifically with the reflectors and the pedal reflectors. It was vetoed at that time by the governor for a number of issues, but there have been efforts to do this on the statewide level. Unless the city wants to find a sponsor, and we can move forward and look at that, but these are statewide laws. Well, I, I would welcome if the coalition, all of you want to come together and say, here are a number of things that you'd like to see changed at either local or state for us to identify those that we support and, and that we would. Coalition. I just, I said oh, yeah. a, a coalition, I didn't say yeah. the coalition, okay. any, but that, you know, people to come forward, whatever it may be, whether it be um, your group or the coalition, whatever, that we welcome that. Stupa. Thank should you. bikes have to stop David at a stop sign, Norman. Mr. Box? Yes. Yeah. No, the cyclist should. The bike, I think, will stop when the cyclist stops. Uh -huh. But cyclists should stop at uh, yeah. stop signs and stop lights and follow the law. Um, yes, indeed. And I do believe, Madam Chair, Hollywood Boulevard has an ordinance that prohibits skateboards and bicycles. That's part of the The guy was east of the 101. You're speaking of west of the 101. Okay, thank you. You said Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, David Norman and Alan Alessio, if you would like to come up. I'm David Norman with Councilman Reyes' office. Uh, as maker of this motion, Councilman Reyes supports a report from the Board of Police Commissioners on bicycle licensing efforts in the city of Los Angeles. After reviewing the findings within the report and after hearing public comments on the issue, Councilman Reyes is pleased with the commissioner's outcome and overall recommendations. The council member would like to thank the committee, the advocates, and city staff, and encourage them to move it to council quickly. Uh, it's a great achievement for everyone who worked on it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I should have called you up first for the count. Thanks, council member leadership. Alan, and we'll have Russell Buchanan as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Alessio, and I'm a resident of Long Beach. Uh, but I uh, happen to visit LA just almost every day. Uh, the bicycle license law is aimed. They're aiming it at everybody, not just L.A. residents. Uh, the municipal, municipal code is uh, overextending itself. Um, CVC code says that you can go ahead and uh, uh, establish these uh, license for residents. But what municipal code is saying is it's for everybody. But they're overextending what CVC code is telling them what to do. Therefore, uh, I, I find it to be uh, illegal, so it shouldn't be enforceable. So um, it needs to be checked in as far as that goes. Uh, it's also being used as just a harassment tool. It's not, it's not for any other purpose. I haven't seen any kind of data as far as uh, any benefits from it at all, other than for harassing the cyclist. Thank you. Thank you. You have the same cold height? Yeah. <laughs> Russell, then we'll also, Arisha. Uh, Russell Buckin. Uh, <clears throat> I just quickly wanted to address uh, the issue of accidents and being able to identify cyclists when there's an accident. There's a good program out there called Road ID, which uh, provides you with uh, either a bracelet or a military-style dog tag that has your name and your health insurance number and known allergies and anything else that EMTs might need to know. So that's another thing that can be taken care of outside the boundaries of a mandatory uh, law. Um, as Mr. Alessio just pointed out, uh, LEMC 26.01 actually is out of compliance with Section 21 of the CVC, the Uniformity of Code, because it requires that any no person, or it provides that no person shall operate a bicycle without a license, whereas uh, the CVC only authorizes cities and counties to provide that no resident shall operate. So it's going to have to be changed anyway. If you're going to change it, you might as well repeal it. I think every, almost everybody in the room at this point agrees 
that it serves no purpose that can't be achieved outside of it. it. Its only real purpose is to serve as a tool of harassment, as I can personally attest to. And uh, just, if, I don't know if I'm violating protocol by uh, addressing Councilman LaBange directly, but at this point, I, I got to ask you, what are we clinging to here? Why do we want to, why are you fighting, why would we want to fight to preserve this law when the, anything that it can achieve can be achieved outside of it? I don't know that, and I don't hear that from the officials from the city, and that's why we're going to ask them to study it. So uh, I think it's appropriate. As a, as a parent, I think anything you have, uh, to see what parents think about it, you, you know, that would be okay. I understand that. But you have a difference of opinion. I thank you for your comment. Well, I, I appreciate your concern, but uh, the police have already put it on the record that they're willing to make their services available to engrave people's uh, identifiable information on their bicycle frames so people who are concerned about theft or child abduction or, any, or the like can still participate and still have that security without having this mandatory licensing program that isn't helping anybody. Thanks. Thank you. And Mark Peterson. Go ahead. Okay, so not to repeat what everyone else said, so I won't. Actually, I am from the LA County Bicycle Coalition, and we, of course, support. Um, again for the record. My name is Orisha. Okay. And um, so, of course, we support revoking this law altogether. Um, again, Mr. Tom LeBange, I would like to say that what you are asking for is a, is a separate program that can be looked at separately from the bicycle license. And actually, we are, we've already started working with um, LAUSD Tonneball um, to, to try to make it safer for children to ride their bikes to school, to encourage them to ride, and, and, and many other things. So that's a, I, I encourage you to look at it as a separate issue that has nothing to do with bicycle license, but a safety measure for, for um, youth cyclists. And that's it. Thank you. I think Tanya also works with Safe Moves, and the two of them have done a lot of programs right. out there to educate people. And we have a we're contract working with, with her moves. on that, and so I think that's actually falls into that category. Thank you, what I would Mr. Suggest. Peterson. Thank you. Hi. Um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, uh, I would also encourage that broken the, CD, <laughs> a broken CD, um, or a malfunctioning MP3, something like that. Um, I would also encourage you to, uh, to to strike the law from the books, and if. It's, uh, and if uh, or when cycling is much more uh, prominent in the city and it becomes an issue that bicycles may need to be registered at some point, we make a new law. We write it from the bottom up so that we have something that is actually functional. I think there's much better ways to identify children if they have a bicycle accident. Um, there's a, particularly since you can be separated from a bicycle in an accident. Um, and certainly, um, as far as recovering stolen bikes, there's private organizations that do a much better job of tracking these kinds of things without burdening any of the city organizations from doing so. So that would be my suggestion. Thanks. Thank you very much. So what we have before us is the report from the police uh, department, police commission, and, and rec I would recommend we adopt, adopt what's before us. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think if you approve the, um, the commission report, but then also request the city attorney to prepare the ordinance to um, uh, make the necessary changes and then declare a moratorium on the uh, ordinance as it is now. That would be the order. Immediate moratorium. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Item number nine is a DOT report in response to a Rosendahl rule motion relative to the feasibility of installing audible pedestrian signals. So they're all looking as what we did. What we did was, uh, did you understand the date, no. Anne? Okay. I miss? Yeah, I so what we did was uh, adopt what you all wanted was the program will now be defunct. This one and yes. <laughs> yeah, You're welcome. We, we want to thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming. And let's keep focused on the Bicycle Bill of Rights, too, going forward. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Wong. I'm the Senior Transportation Engineer with the Design Division. Um, at the request of the City Council, we have prepared a report on the feasibility of installing accessible pedestrian signal throughout the city. DOT currently has a program to install the APS devices to assist individuals with disabilities uh, based on requests that we receive from the public. Today, these APS devices are available at 58 intersections throughout the city. Out of the 58 location, 34 of them are with the older uh, devices with the cuckoo and PP sound, and the remaining 24s are with the more modernized APS units, which consists of a locator tone, 
uh, push button and a vibro tactile uh, arrow. Uh, recently, we have been working very closely with the uh, Commission on Disability as well as the Department on Disability on the installation of this uh, devices. Two of the most uh, recently constructed ones are here in the Civic Center. One is connecting City Hall and City Hall East, um, with the other one connecting Parker Center and City Hall East. Mr. Russell, this was your motion. I'll yeah, and uh, thank you so much for moving so quickly and getting back to us. Uh, this came up from a, a constituent in Via Marina uh, over in my Del Rey area um, who was blind, and, and he asked me that question. Um, how do we determine which intersections uh, we we deploy this in? Well, we basically, the, the uh, approval is based on the request that we re receive from the public. If the constituent has a special request, he could go ahead and make the request and we would in turn approve it and prepare a design plan and, uh, and program for construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, can we get that message out to neighborhood councils? <coughs> sure, we can. The Del Rey Neighborhood Council didn't know it. Obviously, my constituent didn't know it. No one knew it in, yes, in the sir. district. But to hear that it exists and that one can appeal uh, through a process there and suggest that they get it makes sense. I think we should also look a little bit at the density of people crossing streets and not necessarily totally rely on a constituent uh, uh, issue. People just don't know about it, and not everybody gets messages from neighborhood councils either. Sure. But I would like, at least in my office, I'm going to send out a blast to uh, my constituents, letting them know there is this opportunity uh, to check in on it. Because as we saw in the last four or five years, which everybody gives us praise for it, uh, as you see the timer going down and saying how many seconds left uh, to cross the street. They say, good job, Bill. And, of course, we had nothing to do with it, but we like credit when we get it. Uh, <laughs> but the same thing with this issue. It exists. It's in place. We'll get the message out uh, to our constituents. But do let no neighborhood councils know about this. And let, let, if we do have any relationships uh, with some of the disability organizations, which I'm sure we do, we should get the message to them as well. Now, I'm not asking us to be overwhelmed and all of a sudden have a big financial issue here, mm -hmm. but, but, but the more people are aware that there is that opportunity, the happier I am. Thank you. Yes, we'll do that. Right. Uh, and, uh, Any other questions, colleagues? Just, yes, Mr. Parks. That's one thing. Uh, and I forget how many thousands of intersections we have, but if we go along the process of replacing them based on community requests or council requests, we may never get through the city. I'm just wondering whether we should establish a policy that this is the standard equipment for our intersections so that when we go out and build a new traffic signal, it's automatically implemented. If we fix one that's destroyed due to a traffic accident, it should be upgraded to that standard. Uh, if we're fixing left turn signals and we're there, it just seems as though rather than deal with them on a ad hoc basis that we would have a policy that says this is the state of the art equipment mm -hmm. and it should be implemented whenever we go out and touch an intersection and we should implement the state of the art equipment. And I'm just wondering, you know, we will all be gone by the time we deal with it intersection by intersection, mm -hmm. but have we analyzed how we can do it more systematically because there's reasons for us going out to these intersections for a lot of reasons, whether it's red light enforcement, whether it's dealing with uh, re-engineering it, a variety of things. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like we would, we're making double steps to go out and fix one thing and then later get a request to have this type of technology. It should be a standard. For now, we uh, our policy, we have been have an annual program to install about APS at about 10 locations right now with the current funding and the staffing. Um, John? Yeah, but, but I, I will add that we, we do foresee the day sometime when this will just be standard equipment, just like pedestrian heads are standard equipment and now countdown signals are standard equipment. Uh, with the limited funds we have right now, though, uh, our emphasis right now is uh, putting them along the major transit corridors. So like along the uh, expo line that's being built, that's standard equipment at the stations. Uh, right now we've initiated a project to build accessible pedestrian devices between Union Station and City Hall here. And last week we installed two of them at the Main Street crosswalk 
and the Los Angeles Street mid-block crosswalk as well. So with limited funds we have available, we really need to get them out at the civic centers, at the transit locations, and use our limited resources for that. But I do foresee the day when it will become standard. No, I understand what you're saying, but I think what I would think we would want to do is you're dealing with it project by project, exposition line downtown. It would appear that you would assess the city and then come back to the council and say, we believe that these are the kinds of thoroughfares, transit zones that we need to deal with them, and we need 5,000. And allow the council to say, well, we can fund 300 a year or 200 a year, but not just view it within the parameters of what money you have currently, but what is it that the city should be looking at now and in the future so we can create the state of the art as opposed to being drugged with the state of the art behind the curve. So if there's Very, criteria, I mean, if there's criteria yeah. that you've established, how many intersections fit the criteria and what's the price tag? And can we address them annually at so many per year or can we address them in some fashion to where when certain things occur as incidents such as traffic collisions and we repair a light? I mean, it seems as though we need a, would have a plan as opposed to incrementally doing them because we have the expo line are incrementally doing them because uh, we're saying, well, we'll do it here because we have this budget. If we never know what the cost is, we never can put it at least in a priority to look at in the future. Right. I, I, I think it's a point well taken. We've very, in very recent times of transition from where mm -hmm. we did it based on a study, yeah. which took a lot of time, and then we didn't approve all of them. Then we've transitioned to the point where we do it upon request without a study to expedite it. The point we're at now is let's put it at the uh, key locations where they're most needed. And I think what you've just said would be the next step. And I would suggest that in a uh, future budget year when we can have some of our signal monies returned and we can make the request, I think this is something we will want to put on the agenda to go to the next step. I think if we wait and say we're going to wait until there's money, we'll always be inhibited in going forward. But if you tell us what we need, plus if we have a plan, I don't know if the, whether these would be eligible for call for projects for MTA because you have a plan already in place you, as opposed to saying, well, we're just going to keep dealing with the limited funds we have. So I'm just asking if we set the criteria Give us some idea of what the dollar figure is and let the council figure out whether we can deal with it year to year or whether we can have a three-year plan, a 15-year plan, or whether we'll have something in play that safety loo comes in or call for projects. You can start piecing through it as opposed to saying, well, we'll just do what our budget reflects. Yeah. We'll be glad to get back with you on that information. It's about 9000 per intersection. 4,400 intersections. Yeah. Well, I think we would pick priorities for their installation, but uh, yeah. I, I think your point is well taken. Because yeah. I think if, if we're out there for a reason, we would save, I would think, personnel costs. If we're out there to reconstruct an intersection because of a traffic collision and we fix it to the state of the art, as opposed to fixing it and then going back and retrofit it. Okay. <clears throat> We'll top the report um, that we have here, which actually um, improves the motion um, and receive and file a DOT report. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Item 11. Okay. Thank you. Next item is 11, right? uh, item 11, which is a grow we our uh, Labange motion route to the funding for operational and signal improvements. Yes, and I think what we wanted to do is also to talk to Kathy Deladani, who's here too as well, to go over what these, where the signals will be, how they'll be operated in and come back in that 30 days with that having had that meeting and discussion and to where this will be. That's how I would amend the recommendation. So to approve the motion and ask DOT to come back in 30 days, but to get with uh, Kathy in the group as well. Okay. Okay. Yep. Right with that, Kathy? Okay. Okay. And the last 
I'm sorry, the last item is item 13, which is a Garcetti Reyes motion relative to the development of community parking district consistent with the Outwater Village pedestrian oriented district. Great. How are you? Hello, my name is Marcel Porras from Council President Eric Garcetti's office. I'm here to introduce Mott Smith from Civic Enterprises who has been working on this project in conjunction with the Atwater Village Neighborhood Council and also with the uh, Department of Transportation and City Planning. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Members, for having, having me here today. Um, I'm going to very, very quickly present what this program is. And there's a package in front of you right here. Uh, the map shows the pedestrian-oriented district segment that this program would apply to. And there are three big goals for this program. One is to move from ad hoc planning to real planning, uh, because the parking policies that are applied on our main streets uh, often don't work for the properties that are there, given the property sizes and the nature of the uh, businesses that are already there. Uh, this would allow us to actually do comprehensive planning rather than case-by-case -case solutions. Second thing is to create a livelier, more walkable, and safer Glendale Boulevard, which is something that's very important to the community and something that's very important to the businesses that are there. And thirdly, very, very importantly, to support small neighborhood businesses that right now are shut out by the process. If we go to the next page, you can see the problem. And those of you who remember putting this program in place in Eagle Rock will recognize these images. The problem is that the typical lot in, uh, on many of our main streets, and Atwater is very typical of this, is less than 7,500 square feet. And what the community wants is a lively pedestrian streetscape with the sorts of buildings you see on the left. Um, if I want to do a change of use in a building like that, though, and I show up at the city, uh, the only type of project that I can get approved over the counter looks like the one on the right, which basically looks like a liquor store or an auto shop or a, or a Taco Bell. Um, so what do we do about this? We don't undo our requirement that we uh, plan parking. We don't just say anything goes. Instead, what we do is rather than requiring parking to be provided uh, project by project, case by case, we look to where there's excess parking capacity in the neighborhood, and we allow small businesses, and very importantly, only small businesses on small properties, to take advantage of, of that availability by renting shares of the community parking and being able to get their approval to do good pedestrian-oriented projects over the counter, in essence. Um, there, we, we did a survey to establish the amount of parking that was available in the area. And if you will skip, you can skip this page that compares how we do things now to what we're proposing. If you go to the last page, you can see the results of the survey. There, um, there are about 324 parking spaces that the city owns in Atwater Village. And these are metered on-street spaces, and these are uh, unmetered spaces in two city lots uh, behind some of the properties there. We went out and did DOT standard surveys for 14 hours during the week and 14 hours on the weekend and established that uh, there are quite a few vacancies on average uh, all the time in, in the area. DOT asked us to um, suggest a pool of, of zoning parking credits that would, if every, if, if every parking credit were uh, used for new business in the area, that there would still be about 15 percent vacancy in the metered spaces on the street. So somebody showing up to get a cup of coffee would have a place to park. If you look at the chart, the red block, so, so the first column says weekday day. So that, that would be uh, between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. on a typical weekday. Out of the 324 spaces, on average, 156 were occupied during our survey, uh, which was an hourly survey. 120 spaces were open, and we want to hold 49 spaces vacant just to make sure there's still excess capacity there. What this program would do, for instance, for weekday daytime properties, or weekday daytime use, I should say, is create 120 zoning credits that new businesses could apply for and essentially get over the counter without having to go through the complexity of demonstrating that they have parking covenants, parking leases, uh, or going through the very costly and time-consuming variance process that uh, tends not to work for the sorts of small businesses that are revitalizing streets like Glendale Boulevard. And uh, we've done extensive outreach with the community. This was really a project of the Atwater, Atwater Village Neighborhood Council and uh, very pleased to have been able to work on it. I'm happy to answer any questions. And, 
And I so, like it. I, yeah. I know that we're working on our Abercany Street, and others are dealing with that issue at, at this point. But the one thing I want to make sure it doesn't happen is that we uh, act like there are parking and there's not parking. Uh, what I've inherited when I got into this job was a lot of variances were given and a lot of um, grandfathering took place. But the reality is all my side streets for the residential people are inundated because everybody would hire a valet service without the real ironclad clarity that they had a place for them to go. And so residents couldn't park their cars anymore. And my biggest issue was Abercany, though there's other places where I had to actually get closer to the beach. So uh, how does that address that? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. You're getting to one of the key issues, which is how do you support small businesses without creating an undue impact on the residential neighborhoods to the side? And this program specifically addresses that. Because what we do now is every time an application comes to the city, we say, prove to us you've got the parking. And so they show up with a lease, and the planner at the counter has no really good tools to validate the lease. And, and on an ongoing base, basis, enforcement is a big issue. What this does is it provides an easier, uh, an easier way for businesses to get their approvals. And this is an official survey that only involves public spaces, no leases that somebody has to go track down. Uh, it's all done to DOT standards. And, and part, part of the um, ongoing maintenance of this program is to do annual surveys to make sure that there still is enough parking in, in, in the area to support the uses that are there. I should add that um, the one part of the city where this program exists right now in Eagle Rock, we're actually looking at a second phase, which is a community valet service. Um, and in fact, DOT uh, just came out with, uh, with a request for proposals to choose an exclusive valet provider for the area. And the idea behind that is when you've got multiple valets operating in places like Hollywood or West 3rd Street, um, it's impossible to hold anybody accountable uh, for following the rules because if you say you, you are parking in the residential areas, so that wasn't me, that was the other guy. By having a single valet provider, you can hold people accountable on a What about a business licensing for valet companies like they do in Beverly Hills and other places? Um, well, actually, that is definitely a separate issue, and that's something that we are actually looking forward. Um, that was something that was brought up specifically in the Hollywood area by Council President Garcetti at the transportation topic discussion. And um, over the past year, um, the council office has been meeting with the Department of Transport, all, the, all of the offices involved in the valet process, because originally we had looked at doing an overlay zone or a, a valet district, but it proved to be a little bit more difficult. Um, in addition, we looked at the, the franchising option, but the um, public utilities code um, does not allow for valet franchising. Um, a motion was introduced by Council Member Gruel, along with Council President Garcetti, to request that um, that be changed at the state, le um, state level or to be looked at. Um, currently, we're in the process of introducing another motion um, that will actually direct uh, uh, the CLA together with um, all the affected offices and, and departments to actually look at creating an ordinance that will address this particular issue because it is so complex and there, is, um, there are several different options and models that are out there. Yeah, because the, there's a constituent of mine, actually a businessman, uh, a guy who owns a gas station in my district, who said in Beverly Hills they have it in place. So right. I'd like you to look at Beverly Hills as part of that process there and see what they've done that maybe could be adaptable to the city of Los Angeles. And one of the things that um, we had a breakthrough recently with uh, the Board of Police Commissioners stepping forward and actually wanting to uh, play a larger role in enforcement, and one of the models that they brought forward was the Beverly Hills model. So we definitely have been looking at that. Okay. But what I'd like you to even take a more sense of urgency in our budget crisis situation here, that's another gold in the gutter revenue stream potential besides what it can do for, for the overall issue itself. Well, I think there's also an issue that a lot of, um, because of the, um, the bandit valeting that's happening and the parking on non-permitted lots, yeah. there's a loss of revenue. Right. 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 So you're looking into that? Yes. Do we need to amend the motion? Do we have yes. the committee? Yeah, we have motion on the valet aspect of it, but right. I think the other is in the ensuring that we are collecting all the revenue that was adopted in our one of our mid-year budget items, or it could have been last year's budget, on the Enforcement Police Commission has taken a much more active role yes. on some of those uh, parking lots that have not been working with us. But we find in a number of areas where valet is occurring, there is no valet zone. They're taking over, you know, they're putting their own little signs out and think it's, people think it's real and there isn't the same kind of, again, um, insurance and safety. Parking spots and everything yes. else. Yes, yes, yes. So. 
Well, great. Well, we're, we're looking forward to this model. It's been, I assume an Eagle Rock has done well there um, in its movement and look forward to seeing this in, in Atwater Village. So we would recommend adoption of the motion that's before us today. So moved. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. you. I see you. Feel better. I think, I think Ann Bradley has left, but um, I know she was. She uh, apologized that we're at the end of our meeting for the pub, general public comment. Uh, seeing no other business or other any other public comment cards, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.